Um, we have a great panel for you on global interconnectivity, but before we jump into that, I'm just going to ask the panelists to introduce themselves, what they do at the company, and what their company does. Uh, Vincent? Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Vincent Infeld, uh, freely translated, uh, Vincent in the field. Uh, I'm from the Netherlands, worked with Interaction for 10 years. I head up uh, one of the three business divisions of the Interaction, which is called the Platforms Division. Uh, where we look after all of the uh, major B2C platforms, content platforms, and major B2B platforms, primarily cloud platforms. Thank you, James. Uh, yeah, hi, I'm James McCartney from Telstra. I head up the data center and cloud specialist teams. So uh, the role really for Telstra is to help enable our customers to reach the content and the applications that they need. So that's connectivity into the hyperscale providers, whether it's Amazon, whether it's Microsoft or whether it's GCP. And that's also the extension of uh, private cloud services in our own data centers as well. So my teams really architect that and bring the value, also integrating some of our new platforms uh, around programmable networks and SDN for our customers. Uh, yes, hi, um, I'm Rob Coupland, the European Managing Director for Digital Realty. Um, for those of you that don't know us, we're one of the world's largest um, operators of data centers, uh, operate a, um, a, a, a platform of 200 data centers um, in 32 markets around the world, um, and service cli uh, clients that range from uh, some of the largest uh, deployments of some of the major uh, cloud service providers through global enterprise all the way down to um, kind of local, uh, local startup uh, organizations. Um, most recently entered the um, South American market through the uh, announced acquisition of Ascenti. Thank you. And Guy? Hi, Guy Wilner. Uh, so we're one of the world's largest uh, operators of a data center in Moscow. <laughs> <laughs> I started building a data center there in 2010, and uh, it's been a long journey, an exciting journey, and uh, we've got through all sorts of stuff there. Uh, and so we're just installing uh, one of the first or the first international hypercloud in Russia at the moment, uh, so it's going well. And we're looking at a, uh, starting up a project in Kenya towards the end of the year, so watch this space. I like the, large, the world's largest acronym, so my name is Dick Turnus, I'm Managing Director for Edge Connects in NAMIA. Uh, we are the world's largest edge uh, data center provider. Um, we operate 31 data centers currently across the US and uh, EMEA. Uh, we have nine in the making, uh, so it's uh, um, a big growth spur for us. Good afternoon to everybody. My name is Giuseppe Valentino. I run the product management team for data solutions in Sparkle. Sparkle is a carrier, so we run a global fiber-based network with all sorts of uh, connectivity flavor services. But we also operate uh, regionally, mainly in South Europe and the Mediterranean Basin, some data center and cloud platform assets. Perfect, thank you. So just before we jump into the key topics, um, I'm just going to ask a couple of panelists to, to talk about the trends they've seen in, in cloud connectivity and to what extent do you see enterprises moving to cloud and multi-cloud? Um, let's start with James. Um, yes, I mean, with regards to our business, I mean, Telstra is, is in the world of connectivity, as you all know, and what we're seeing from our customers today is an increased demand for connectivity into the cloud. So when we, when we really engage, you know, we have a large co-location footprint around the world as well, and that extends up into China. Um, when we really engage with our customers, one of the first questions they ask is, is who can we connect into in the public cloud? And, and that's why a lot of our strategy has been around how we develop platforms that enable our customers to seamlessly connect from their private cloud environments into the public cloud environments. And, and that's really the trend we're seeing. It's less around the carry neutrality, but more around how do we connect, how do we move our workloads and our applications. That's really what we're seeing. Yeah, I mean, I think we would concur with that. Certainly what the, the journey we see enterprises on is uh, they're grappling with um, uh, which workloads they need to put where, how do they deal with some of the legacies they have, but also how do they access the multi-cloud environment. And so, you know, I think to your point, carry neutrality hasn't gone away as an issue, but cloud neutrality and, and how do I get to the right combination to enable the hybrid cloud is, is something that organizations definitely are dealing with, and that's something we, we very much see in our enterprise client base. Great, thanks. Uh, 
Yeah, I'd like to build on from uh, what Rob said because I, um, I agree with him that the workloads in the end determine uh, what connectivity works uh, for what workloads. We roughly see three major splits, if you like. Uh, those workloads where internet is sufficient and works. Uh, there's no particular latency or performance uh, requirements necessarily. Uh, up until the, um, the traditional MPLS or SD-WAN type of interconnection uh, solution. And then the, um, if you look at it as a pyramid, there's, there's, a, there's a particular piece of workloads and particular hybrid applications today which we see emerging uh, where um, for hybrid setups, basically big pipes are required between the private installations of uh, our customers, often in relation to uh, machine learning or IoT uh, type of projects, or even in an SAP HANA uh, setup, <coughs> and where the proximity to the actual cloud being used could be a multi-cloud environment as well, uh, using, for example, a combination of, uh, of an Azure or AWS environment or, or Oracle to that extent. Um, that the proximity to the actual mother cloud, to the infrastructure as a service environment, is really, really uh, important. We've seen requirements even uh, of round trip time latencies of uh, less than two milliseconds. So proximity co-location, which is uh, what, what, what this interaction basically stands for uh, across all of its 13 cities in, in the European metros, is um, uh, not the highest in volume requirements, but uh, sets the most precedent requirements from a latency and performance perspective. So it's about three different type of workloads we bucketed it into, if you like. Interesting, thank you. Sorry, I just want to quickly say, if you go to the link on the screen and you want to submit a question, we'll begin with those in, in about 10 minutes or so, and then again at the end. So it's quite easy to do. Please go to the link and we'll touch on those in a bit. Um, Guy, I just want to jump to you. Would you say that there are any barriers to cloud adoption, and how would you encourage uh, skeptics? It barriers to? Cloud adoption for enterprises. Is yeah. there a reason enterprises would, would, would not want to? Yeah, there are. Just, sorry, stuff. just before I say that, the, the, by the way, the, the, the online thing where you put your question, there's a filter which filters out all the nasty insults and comments before yeah. you get it. Um, barriers to, yeah, there's lots of barriers to, to, to this. Um, I mean, in Russia, for example, they are about 100 milliseconds away from the nearest uh, hypercloud, so there's not really much adoption going to happen until you actually get regions inside Russia. Um, and there's also uh, uh, funding barriers. So if you're in a market where there's not much capital coming in, then all the banks aren't going to do their massive reorganization. So we, we can see that's going to happen in Russia probably in the next three years rather than today. But they're quite good hackers, so they're quite good at uh, putting all this together. But cloud is definitely... Um, coming in very fast, but I think there's a common misconception that uh, some bank, you know, some guy has, Jamie Di uh, Diamond has, has dinner with uh, Jeff Bezos and then, you know, JP Morgan's going Amazon, uh, and the average large enterprise has probably got between 90 and 150 different cloud providers, uh, and so somebody has to tap that all together and join that up, and that's where the data centers come in to provide this. So. For enterprises, it's all about bringing a connectivity hub into a data center where there's bucket loads of connectivity to other cloud providers so that from one single point, they can then access all of their different providers. So the barrier, I guess, is, is, is to try and get those companies, or the challenge is to get those companies into the data center with their connectivity hub. Once you've done that, I think the rest is uh, easy peasy. Okay. Uh, Dick, can you expand on that? Yeah, I think, I mean, uh, uh, to add on to what Vincent was saying earlier in terms of proximity, what we clearly see is, uh, as a barrier is the proximity to the actual what, location where the cloud is because it, it needs to be somewhere. Um, so, I mean, enterprises uh, are scared of where their data goes. Uh, so the new data regulation certainly helps in that respect. Uh, but in some countries, and Germany is just a simple example of that, uh, it needs to be in Germany. And so we see uh, a lot of demand for... Um, a very distributed form right, of cloud uh, where proximity matters and where the data security is uh, guaranteed. Perfect, thank you. Let's talk about the partnership ecosystem. Um, could each one tell me what their role is in this ecosystem and what, who the key partners are and what they contribute to it? Uh, Giuseppe? Yeah, sure. I'm happy to share, let me say, the experience that we developed in these few years. Uh, so, for example, Sparkle as a carrier has uh, engaged relationship with the largest uh, cloud provider 
when they start uh, pushing for private connectivity solutions. So we, for example, enter into the uh, you know, direct connect program of uh, Amazon or the express route program of Microsoft, just to mention two of the largest one. And uh, we, we started this journey about three years ago. And um, <clears throat> uh, also touching back on the drivers of uh, the need of private connectivity into the cloud, we have identified two major drivers. One is security, but probably the, the other one, the most important one is performance, as my colleagues already explained. And what we have been learning dealing with both the cloud engine side and the enterprise side, who is more and more consuming these cloud engine capabilities, is that the consistency of the performance is a key element. The alternative to consume cloud resources is to use the public internet, which is the default today. And 70, 80% we understand from the cloud side provider of the cloud resources are consumed through public internet. But the issue of public internet is consistency of performance. So especially when there is a problem on the internet, whatever, a DDoS attack and so on, then it's when you need maybe your cloud resources and using a shared, let me say, uh, public uh, connectivity uh, uh, platform is less uh, consistency and reliable. So more and more we see cloud players pushing their customer, pushing or let me say, um, uh, inviting their customer to have private connectivity solutions. So uh, we are part of this ecosystem then we are now working with a number of other cloud players like Google or Oracle. And they're all more and more building up this uh, carrier partner ecosystem to provide easy and, let me say, seamless uh, cloud solutions uh, to guarantee the, the aspect that I mentioned before. Interesting. Thank you. Um, Vincent? Yeah. Um, the ecosystem, or as we refer to it internally in our strategy, is uh, communities of interest, is at the heart of our strategy for uh, at least the last 10 years uh, we're working. Um, at the end of the day, we provide a small piece of the jigsaw uh, to solve for, for example, the enterprise you know, hybrid cloud requirements to execute their hybrid cloud strategies. Um, if you look at the value chain, uh, then we have established partnership relationships. Um, in the beginning, as we've always done with the carrier community. Uh, we co-locate over 700 unique carriers across 13 cities in Europe, and they are the fundament and the enabler inside our data centers of people interconnecting to each other. So we foster that community greatly, and we appreciate uh, their presence, because without that fundament, the, the, the value of the data center uh, would diminish. On top of that sit the provide side, if you like, the cloud service providers, uh, like Amazon, uh, like Microsoft, like Oracle, like IBM, like Google. Uh, we've enabled those all, and they're all accessible from all of our data centers to our customers, meaning there are uh, high-performance connections, private connections available from each of our data center. And for the last 10 years, we've worked very hard in partnering with them to enable that interconnection capability from those data centers. But further down the line, towards the moving up the stack, if you like, towards the enterprises, um, there's over 400 unique systems integrators and managed service providers present in our data centers today, really servicing the end customer, the enterprises. Um, so that value chain is critical in solving for our, in the end, our end customer uh, problem. Um, just the data center element of that is, is, uh, is not a solution. So um, we are spending a lot of time and effort in um, ensuring we have the right partnerships and alliances with the people to solve for the entire jigsaw. Often the contracting in the end of that solution uh, ends up with a system integrator or uh, uh, someone else higher up that value chain. But more and more what we see is that the location, the actual data center physical location where you, you put your, let's say, your remaining private clouds uh, on-premise equipment and where you want to interconnect to the, um, to the major clouds you use or would like to use in the future. The discussion on location and data centers becomes uh, more and more strategic. So that's good for us. Uh, that helps us differentiate from just being a data center to a, a strategically relevant data center environment for the execution of uh, the IT strategy of our customers.
Perfect, thank you. And in terms of a connectivity aspect, uh, perhaps James, who's from Connectivity and a cloud pr provider, could expand on that. So, yeah, I mean, if, if I just go back a, a step as well, to, you asked the question about what's stopping customers moving. Um, you know, a huge part of the conversation we have with our customers every day is around compliance. Um, it's really stopping a number of people moving to the public cloud or certainly making them very nervous of that move. With regards to sort of a, a connectivity ecosystem perspective, you know, and, and expanding on to the hyperscalers, I mean, I would imagine a lot of people in this room partner with Telstra for network services globally and across Asia Pacific, you know, certainly we're customers of people on this uh, panel with us. And I don't think when we look at our enterprise customers and the environments that they're trying to move into a hybrid cloud environment, um, we can't do that by partnering. You know, we work with Amazon, we work with Azure, we work with the data center providers around connectivity and how we provide and enable our customers the flexibility to use the platforms we provide. And that's really the, the drive for the majority of our customers. And again, um, the conversations are very different by customer segment around what they require and where they are on that public cloud journey. I mean, you know, some of our customers have not even started. And Southeast Asia for, for Telstra, it's, you know, it's behind um, where we are in Amir, it's behind where we are in Australia and also the US. It's a, it's a much less mature market. Um, but from a partner perspective, yeah, I mean, it's, it's so important to us, which is why we also have a, a part of our business called Ventures, which invests in you know, new technologies that we can then bring to our customers around security, cloud compliance, and connectivity. Perfect, thank you. I just want to jump on the Amazon and Microsoft topic, which is obviously quite a hot topic. Uh, Rob, in terms of balancing the threats partner relationship, uh, do you want to expand on your strategy? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of interesting. And in, in fact, funnily enough, um, I was uh, chatting with a, a kind of a, a tech startup yesterday uh, over on the stand. And um, as, as uh, after we kind of got past him trying to sell his dream to me, uh, I asked him where, where his platform sat. And the answer is, well, they sit in the Amazon cloud. And, and, and so that's the kind of business that 10 years ago was powering the growth of the uh, uh, the uh, you know the interactions and the equinixes and the digital realties and, and all of our predecessors, um, and actually th those things don't come and take a rack in sovereign house anymore. They now go and power up an Amazon cloud. So in, in some ways you've seen this displacement of demand, but at the other extreme you've then got this kind of huge um, uh, kind of acceleration of adoption by enterprises. Enterprise grapples with uh, what to do with um, it, its IT platform, its IT stack and how to move that into a connected world. And I think as enterprises uh, have got to grips with the value they're holding in their data and, and how to unlock that, uh, you see them really kind of thinking about which bits need to fit where. And that's driving the huge growth uh, of platforms for Amazon and Microsoft and, and all of the rest, which ultimately means that they're, they're big consumers of, of what we do. Um, but also they become you know, uh, really interesting partners uh, in terms of how we get to unlock that enterprise demand uh, and the hybrid solution there. So I think the answer is it, it's a kind of complicated relationship because there's been some displacement of, of demand that historically may have come directly to somebody like us, but the, you know, the balance of the relationship and the balance of, of, of how that works is, is ultimately very positive for us as an industry because it's become a huge, uh, huge driver of, uh, of the demand and consumption of, of what we do. Um, Guy, can you expand on this? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, in, in emerging markets, it's, it's highly unlikely that any of these guys are going to build their own data center because it's an absolute bloody nightmare, as I've experienced personally. So I don't think they'd want to go through all of that. And these are smaller installations anyway. So I think as, as this whole, all this stuff moves out to the edge, uh, and that's basically the other 92% of the population, um, then there will be a much more pragmatic approach. So I think in, in, in Western Europe, US, Australia, Singapore, or whatever, then you take out big chunks, build your own, or whatever you do. But in every other country, you're, you're talking about partnering up and trying to find somebody who's doing something in one of those countries. Uh, so I think there's, that, that's going to spread out a lot. Uh, and therefore, it's much more uh, of a normal business relationship with something like an Amazon and a Microsoft, where you know, you've got a supplier of data center providing them access to the market. Okay, perfect, thank you. Okay, I'm just going to jump to the question from the audience quickly. Um, ultra low 
latency to public clouds? Is it overblown? Do so many applications need it? I think we first need to understand what ultra low latency would be. Um, I'm going to, Dick, would you be able to take this one? I was trying to think of a uh, ultra low latency application. I think that's, that's the relevant question. Uh, I think, I mean, in the end, all of it is driven by uh, the use case of, uh, uh, on one side, the, the, uh, the benefit of this low latency, and on the other side, the cost of delivering it to the end user. So there's no specific application that comes to my mind, but that would be the balance right, between the two to make it work. Um, Indeed, the question is, what is the definition of ultra-low latency? I mean, do we, do we see the sub-microsecond latency requirements that we traditionally saw in the uh, algorithmic trading market, financial services? Uh, no. Um, the best use cases I've seen so far requiring ultra-low latency in, in, in the new world definition or in the cloud definition or in the enterprise workload applications um, has been the example uh, I mentioned before is the SAP HANA example which requires not, not on the physical infrastructure network layer, but on the um, application layer, a two millisecond round of time between the private databases of customers and actually the processing power uh, they want to use from a, from a public cloud installation. Um, the other example we see is in the uh, ad tech world, whereby uh, people want to apply real-time advertising to, to, to users online or on mobile. Um, if you think about the process of uh, people clicking on the internet, uh, capturing that data, translating that data, uh, identifying you as a user, as a person, understanding your interest as a user, and then being able to put back an advertisement which is meaningful to you as a person, that whole processing time is uh, uh, sub-seconds in the end. So you can, you can think about um, new data hubs whereby large volumes of data are being aggregated and need to be near real-time processed. Uh, what can be processed locally on the device? What can be processed uh, centrally and needs to be processed centrally? Uh, whether it's the, uh, the driverless car or whether it's uh, other IoT type of examples. I think the industry really needs to sort this out yet. I mean, uh, if you look at the amount of data which can be captured on a, um, a mini-stick in a home uh, with new IoT devices, I saw a uh, Google um, uh, announcement a couple of weeks ago. It's just amazing. I, I think we're at the forefront of something we don't understand really yet in terms of the volumes of data, data separation between edge, central, processing, non-processing, real-time processing, uh, next-day processing. Um, it, this doesn't exist yet. That's my uh, viewpoint. Interesting. Thank you. Um, I just want to touch a bit on how do you balance your own investments versus partnerships? Um, to what extent you roll out your own investments? And uh, Giuseppe, can I pass this to you? Can you expand better the, the question? So, in terms of balancing what you board yourself and where you, you use partners, um, do you want to talk a bit about Sparkle's strategy? Okay. Um, let me say, uh, talking about cloud, for example, uh, we uh, develop our own cloud solution, IT solutions, which we Again, we integrated in our more traditional carrier connectivity solution. So we learn, uh, you know, about these, uh, let me say, new paradigm of services. And uh, it's interesting enough, uh, more than the multi-cloud, uh, let's say, requirement the market uh, has been pushing on, we have started up uh, partner, partnering with uh, cloud players, not only for the connectivity program that I mentioned before, but also reselling their services. So, Going back to the two uh, giants that we, we, you mentioned before, uh, Amazon and Microsoft, for example, we cooperate with them, bo with both of them, in reselling their services. And um, for example, with uh, Amazon, we jointly uh, won a bid for the European Commission for the digital agenda, and we are supporting them in providing the, the cloud. Uh, solutions to uh, these institutional organizations at European level. The interesting aspect, for example, in case of Amazon is that they tend to have a very standard, uh, let me say, industrial product. So they need some partners that customize the SLAs, the, the go-to-market of these services. So that's the roadmap we've been going through with uh, these uh, cloud players. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, James, same question. 
Yeah, so, I mean, Telstra's traditionally had its own cloud platforms globally, um, and, well, we called it cloud. It, it was really, you know, it was compared to the public cloud, to the Amazons, to um, the Azures by our internal sales teams, and what we've now done is we've really flipped that, so we're working much more closely with uh, Google Cloud, Azure, and AWS, really to build differentiation for our services onto those platforms. So. Um, Really, our IP comes by bringing that together to create solutions. So that includes, you know, the compliance engines that we provide to our customers, the analytics that we provide to our customers, integrating that for our customers into maybe their ITSM tools that they have. And that's where we see the differentiation. Um, standardized investment on our own cloud platforms is really too difficult because we see each customer's requirement as unique. Um, especially when we're looking at some of the emerging markets when we're deploying infrastructure into Thailand or Vietnam for some of our customers. You know, it's very specific to their requirements and, and that then links into the connectivity we provide around the region. So, cloud provider, absolutely. Amazon and Azure, or Azure and AWS and GCP every day rather than invest in our own. We can't compete with them. We can't compete with their IP. We can't compete with their development timescales. So take advantage of the platforms they build from AI and machine learning, like you mentioned, and integrate that into our solutions to solve our customers' problems. Yeah, well said, thank you. Um, in terms of, same question, but coming to um, emerging markets now, and what role you can play in emerging markets or European cloud players specifically, um, Rob? Yeah, um, I mean, fr from our perspective, um, we're really driven by uh, where we see our customers wanting to, to get to. So, um, you know, the demand that we're seeing from some of those big platforms and the kind of geographies that they're looking looking at around the world is, is part of what drives our kind of rationale in terms of, of where we go next. So, you know, what you see us doing is, is investing significantly in the markets we're already in because uh, those are, uh, you know, whilst they're not emerging markets, they're far from finished in terms of uh, demand. Um, but then you see us spreading the platform out. So most recently, that's the uh, uh, acquisition that we've announced in uh, Latin America, in Brazil, uh, which is about, uh, you know, opening out that market, which is an area where we see uh, demand uh, coming from some of the major platforms. Um, so what uh, was behind the joint venture we did in Japan last year with uh, Mitsubishi, which is about opening out that market. And I think for us, the key is we're, we're, we're very clear where we add value and where we add value is in our ability to invest um, and build and operate uh, data centers. But we're also very clear that as you go into uh, new markets, understanding the dynamic of that market um, in terms of, of ena enabling that and the ways of doing business is, is actually uh, one of the key factors to success. And that's why partnership becomes quite key there. Yeah, perfect. Uh, Guy, can you expand on that from your own perspective? Yeah, um, I mean, in terms of the, you know, moving into those emerging markets, um, the, you know, the requirements are quite unique. I think there is this, uh, you know, there just isn't anything in those markets at the moment. So when you're coming in, it's kind of virgin territory in some of these places. So it's, it, you know, it's definitely in the new frontier, if you like. There's, there's an awful lot that's going to happen over the next 10 years in those markets. It's going to be a big fight. And, a lot of investment in them as well. Yeah, perfect, thank you. Okay, before we go on to our final section, I'm just gonna address the question from the audience. Um, how do you see the split trends in USPs between public and private cloud, and where do carriers split better? I think Joseph has actually touched on this a bit, so I'm gonna give it back to you. Do you wanna elaborate? Yeah. If, if you can see the question. Okay. <laughs> um, well, uh, not sure there is a perfect fit on this of carriers. I think, uh, uh, as we already touched, this is a, a key, a really key co enabler, the key enabler of the cloud consumption is the connectivity, and the carriers are the one, by definition, who have to facilitate this job. Um, so, um, in these terms, uh, of course, uh, um, uh, let me say the evolution we are seeing um, goes from uh, the, let me say, the speed, for example. Now, we have gone through this journey of providing these uh, cloud connectivity solutions, and when we started three years ago, the requirement we were addressing were for 
10, 100 megabit, uh, 500 megabit. Uh, today it's mainly 1G connectivity, private connectivity. We are starting uh, processing orders for 10G and multiple 10G. So there is an evolution, of course, which goes you know, normally with the, in our technology with the scalability. Um, as I said, um, uh, there are, let me say, more and more cloud players who are developing these, uh, let me say, programs and uh, uh, partnership, uh, partnership uh, system. There are more and more data center providers who are providing these intermediating platforms, which are simplifying a lot the connectivity between the end customer and the cloud engine with the carrier in the middle who doesn't need necessarily to create one-to-one uh, -one interconnection and testing schemes and so on. So there, there are matrix, uh, uh, interconnection matrix available in the largest data center players. Uh, we have, for example, entered uh, Equinix Cloud Exchange already three years ago. And that, for example, uh, it's probably the first one who started up already today through that platform we see uh, more than 50 different cloud engines and players. So this is the direction we are seeing in terms of. Perfect, thank you. And with that, we're going to move on to our final section, which is cloud enablement at the edge and how is this facilitating data traffic around the world. Um, I'm going to pass this over to Dick. What sort of trends are you seeing in uh, edge connectivity? And uh, perhaps elaborate from your own perspective. Um, well, our name is not Edge Connects for nothing. Uh, so we highly believe in the uh, localization of traffic. Uh, and I guess, I mean, the, um, our business was started around localization of traffic in the U.S., where what we call the Netflix effect uh, basically consumed uh, um, the MSO's networks, made them far too expensive, and the end user got a very crappy end user experience. Um, that was, I guess, just the beginning. Um, I think, I mean, everybody on this panel will agree that uh, traffic is booming. Uh, the utilization itself is heavily uh, localized through all sorts of applications uh, that we can't even, as, as I guess Vincent was saying earlier, that we can't even think of today. Yeah. Um, so I mean, we see our role as the, basically the facilitator of localization, of um, uh, keeping traffic and content, and content can be anything from traditional right, content to cloud content, to keep that local, right, to optimize the balance between, on one side, the user experience and what the requirement for the application is, and on the other side, but the, the cost of ownership, because otherwise, but it doesn't work. Yeah, uh, yeah um, couldn't agree more. And um, part of, part of our strategic thinking is okay. What used to be edge um, it will will be redefined in the next foreseeable future. Um, and the question is, what data has to stay local? Needs to be processed local. Uh, and needs to have workloads sitting behind it. Um, is, is there a federated, you know, a further federated data center infrastructure required uh, next to the big, you know, mobile concentration yes. uh, piles? <laughs> and um, how are we going to operate those? And so that, that 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 is a big question mark where we, as an industry, uh, we we have some preliminary answers to maybe, uh, but not the full answer. And neither does the application side have the full answer yet. If, uh, I'd had, I'd had something sort of more philosophical about this, which is that um, I don't believe that it's a smart thing that all the content and all the distribution is concentrated in eight countries yeah. on the mm. planet. And so the problem is some guy in Nairobi goes to a really good technical university and he comes out and the only choice he's got is to go to London or to Silicon Valley yeah. to get a job. Uh, that university is paid for exclusively by Kenyan taxes. The big internet companies operating in Kenya maybe don't even have a legal entity. They're selling advertising to Unilever and Colgate Palmolive in their home countries. They're not declaring any revenues in that country. They're not paying any taxes in that country. They're not employing anybody, and there's no service. So, uh, you know, the dirty little secret about GDPR and, and data sovereignty is actually it's more about tax and jobs uh, than it is about anything else, about security. You know, our securocrats run the world at the moment, but that's only temporary. <laughs> Um, but it's more about bringing some of that in. So if you build a 20 megawatt data center in one of these countries and you've been employing thousands of people to build it, then you've got all these other companies coming in, local integrators, local companies, universities doing research, whatever. You're building a whole sort of 
industrial connection to the country. Mm. And so I think it's only natural that the amount of data center, if you like, the amount of servers per pop in a country should eventually reach an equilibrium. Maybe that's in 20 years' time. So I think there's, therefore, outside the sort of ruling eight countries of the internet, there's a few more to come, and there's lots more of events like this to come, I'm sure. <laughs> I would add uh, the fact that apart from performance and, let me say, application and service, which is so the technology is driving the localization of the intelligent platforms closer to the consumption of these uh, services, but there are also regulatory driven uh, drivers. So um, more and more, take GDPR, uh, the uh, data needs to be uh, in within the country with a certain, let me say, guarantees of security and so on. This is an industrial driver for cloud players to localize their platform and their storage, storage capabilities. So independently from technology or, let me say, performance-related drivers. So we see these as definitely, and we see the large players are starting creating what they call the region. Now they open up the region in France. There is a performance driven, uh, let me say, reason why, but there is also a regulatory re, uh, dri uh, driven reason why for that. So there is a mix of, uh, of uh, I would say, of uh, uh, legal slash regulatory and uh, performance. Uh, and it's funny, because when, when the data, data sovereignty started in 2015 in Russia, the whole of the world said, these terrible Russians, it's all about internet freedom, it's a terribly bad thing to do, this data sovereignty thing. And then GDPR came in and everybody said, yeah, it's normal, isn't it? Yeah. So um, each country's doing it, from Thailand to Brazil to Germany. Yeah. Uh, James, Tosh is no stranger to uh, compliance. Um, can you maybe expand on this from a, a compliance point of view and the complications that you may face? Uh, I mean, look, I mean, from a network perspective, um, how we operate, I mean, that's certainly not my part of the business. Um, you know, compliance and individual country regulations of how we operate is, is not something that I really get involved with. But, I mean, I think going, going back to what Guy was saying, this sort of utopia of um, the, the cloud providers um, spreading the love. Um, you know, they're driven by, they're driven by revenues, they're driven by um, the amount of money that is available and the disposable income in a country and by the numbers of people that operate in those countries. So it's, it's pretty easy to track where they would, would, would put their deployments. Um, but, yeah, I mean, just quickly going back to the question that was asked earlier by someone in the audience about USPs between public and private cloud, I think, well, whoever asked that question, you know, it's, from my perspective, you know, the public clouds, AWS is still an infrastructure as a service play, very much so. Microsoft has excellent platform as a service, which really helps our customers drive down costs of their deployments. Uh, private cloud will always be there, and I think the next generation of adoption in, in the public cloud is really going to be around containerization, because it, it's still not easy today to move your workloads from one cloud provider to another. Um, Containerization will enable you to do that as it abstracts away the, the actual hardware layer underneath, which then means private cloud just becomes a natural extension of that. And private cloud in physical data centers, which we all have, will always be there. It will never all disappear onto the public cloud. Where do carriers fit? Connectivity, one-to-many connections, making it easy for our customers. That's really our, our view. Yeah, perfect, thank you. Um, Rob, Jeremy, closing thoughts on this topic? Yeah, I, th I think um, if we, you know, as we sort of sat here 10 years ago thinking about things, we would have been kind of grappling with similar sized problems and things play out. And I think what you kind of see in here is that there's, that, that there's lots of things in play here. But I think when you really kind of bring all of that back together, the, the kind of forward view in terms of uh, what's happening here in terms of the, um, uh, the, the kind of use of data um, and, and how data, uh, how data becomes even more central to how businesses are creating value for themselves, um, then making sure that the, uh, the relationships that we as, a, we as a provider have both with the, uh, the, the big cloud providers and service providers that are providing the services to enable the data uh, and the carrier community that connects that is, is really key. So I think uh, it's going to be fascinating to kind of see how it plays out, but I think being able to 
uh, play globally in there and, and be able to kind of talk to both the biggest and the kind of the smaller end of that to, to enable that is, is, is really key. So I think it's going to be it's going to be an exciting period ahead. Yeah, perfect, thank you. And I think that's a great note to actually end on, unless we have any final questions from the audience. Um, otherwise, I'm just going to thank everyone for coming to our panel, and we're going to thank our panelists for Welcome. this great discussion. Otherwise, thank you. Have a good conference.